uh, and training at, at the Institute of Integrated Knowledge in the United States of America. And she holds a bachelor's degree in international relations from the University of London and an MA in international relations from Queen Mary University London as well. She has also completed a diploma in Islamic education from the International Online University, and she has an interest in a broad range of Islamic disciplines. She has worked as an education consultant, a primary school principal, a curriculum developer, a researcher in Islamic education, and a teacher trainer for schools in the United Kingdom and Pakistan for the last 25 years. She also conducts a number of courses on Quran, Sira, Islamic history, and personal development, and she's a public speaker in contemporary Islamic issues in the Muslim world. She has authored uh, primary level English textbooks and reading books and regularly writes material for homeschoolers and Islamic courses for children of all ages. Uh, that's a very interesting profile, Mrs. Rosma. We're so very happy to have you uh, with us. And on behalf of the administration of Alexander Language Schools and Noag World Academy, um, I'm really so very grateful for you for accepting our kind invitation to be with us today. Uh, Jazakallah khair for having me. I'm really excited to be part of this. Um, and I hope, inshallah, that uh, uh, everyone who is attending today can really benefit from the uh, ideas that I will present, inshallah. And I'm really, really grateful for this opportunity. Jazakallah khair. Um I'm sure. I'm so very excited that we will be starting this. Uh, and as you all know, uh, when we attended uh, the last session, we talked together. Um, I think that this is such a much needed course and methodology for teachers across the Muslim world. So um, we'll be very excited to listen to a, a brief synopsis about the program. And why do you personally think um, that teachers across the world need such programs in, in this particular space and time? Inshallah, yeah. Um, definitely, the uh, situation we're living in is very uncertain. Uh, there are many ideas flying around uh, about what education is and what subjects should be taught and how they should be taught and how character education should play a part within schools. So there's many different um, ideas that are uh, available. So we need to sift through them and we need to find the best procedures, the best processes, the best methods, inshallah, so that we can uh, benefit the next generation of the ummah, inshallah. Oh. Okay, so the floor is yours. Uh, let's um, do like a very short introduction, like um, as you like, um, maybe 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll take uh, uh, questions from the attendees. Inshallah. Okay, so Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa to everyone who is here. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So again, Jazakallah khair for having me, um, and I hope that today, inshallah, by sharing you uh, about the 5D thinking methodology and the ideas behind it, that inshallah uh, we can uh, move forward together to learn more about it and learn how to apply it in the classroom. So I'm just going to very briefly uh, start by introducing uh, the institute that I am involved in currently with this project, that is the in Institute of Integrated Knowledge. And the vision that we have is to become uh, a center of academic excellence as a research and educational institute uh, so that we can provide uh, you know, a, a direction for individuals from different cultural and professional backgrounds to contribute to human flourishing. And the mission is to conduct teaching, research, and outreach activities to explore the meanings and purpose of existence and the human self by offering rigorous interdisciplinary academic programs, inshallah. And uh, just a, a very beautiful line that I really like from the president of the Institute. Um, I'll introduce him a little bit later on to you. Uh, how he puts it, he says that integrated knowledge is a unique approach to read the universe like an elegant book. It's a new way of understanding science to strengthen your belief and to establish sound character. So this is what we are about. This is what we are trying to do. And inshallah, I'm going to go through with you why we need to do this and how we will do it. So the first thing that we need to look at is um, what is the situation uh, today regarding education? If you see on in this diagram, you'll see it says secular uh, science plus secular ideology minus God and character equals excellence without a soul. And this is um, really the, the crux of the matter. This is what we, are, what we want to investigate today. And I really hope that you can explore this idea. 
I really hope you can think of examples yourself of uh, about this uh, equation that we see in modern education, the education that is all over the world, within the Muslim world and the non-Muslim world, everywhere. Science is taught from a secular perspective, and it takes away the, the need for a creator, and it takes away any form of character. So uh, this is uh, something that we need to understand, that we are taught science almost as if though it's um, un indisputable. There's, there's no uh, two ways about anything that is has been taught. And the result is that because you're removing the need for a, a creator and you're removing any values that that creator might be uh, giving you, then you are left with what? You are left with your own ideas, your own opinion, your own moral compass. You're left with basically doing what you want to do. And that is really excellence without a soul. So there's no denying that uh, science uh, that exists today or technology and advancement, there's no denying that it is excellent. There's no denying that. Uh, human beings have uh, you know, gone into the depths of the oceans. They have gone uh, to, the, to the depths of the universe. They have gone right inside the minutest parts of the cell. And they have understood many, many different processes. And they have produced many, many different solutions uh, for human beings. So we can see that this is, there's no denying that at all. And we are not here to deny this when we talk about uh, science and secular ideology. What we are here to discuss is why is it that this perspective is pushed and what is the alternative for it? So the alternative that I would like to show you is um, the 5D thinking solution that we have come up with um, where you have God, science and character, which is your starting point. And you take away from that any secular ideology. And what you will get is you will get excellence with faith and good character. And we know that in the past, uh, we talk about how the Muslims, they uh, excelled in many aspects of science. And we know that they developed many different uh, processes, systems, solutions for the world that they live in. Uh, if any of you know about Muslim scientists of the past, you will know that they were instrumental in a lot of the knowledge that we have today. So we know that algorithms, algebra, all of this uh, was, wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for the work of the Muslim scientists. So this is something that uh, is very, very uh, important that we need to uh, realize. So this is the main uh, crux of the today's presentation. So I want you to try and remember this as much as possible, inshallah. Can um, I ask a quick question before we proceed? Sure. So, um, as I understand, this methodology is compatible with all the monotheistic religions like uh, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, right? That's right, because what we're doing is we are, are going to read the universe, and anyone who reads the universe is going to come to that same conclusion that there's a creator for the universe. So, anyone who believes in the creator for the universe is able to uh, move forward with moral lessons and develop character. We know that um, you know the whole the whole point that we want to discuss today, inshallah, is that secular ideology removed morals. It it just came, uh, totally gave a personalized moral compass to everyone, so people can have a different view on anything. They can have a different view on a, a, a abortion. They can have views on uh, you know using animals for research or using humans for research. It depends on what they want to what to what they want to promote. So they have their own view. But when you have a revealed um, religion, when you have uh, something that is coming from the creator of the universe, then the morals there are more clearly defined. So definitely this is something that can be applied anywhere, inshallah. Okay. So just one example, uh, you know, I'm fascinated by space, always have been since I was little. So for me, this James Webb telescope was an amazing thing. And when I saw the images, I was really, really blown away. But just consider, look at the image of this telescope. Uh, for those of you who may not have known about it. So this is one of the latest uh, telescopes launched by NASA. And it's gone really far into the universe and it's able to find images from billions of light years away. Um, and, and look at its design. Look at its amazing design. Did it come about by itself? Look how many engineers went into, uh, you know, had to spend so many days and nights uh, making it. And not just these engineers, but all the previous knowledge from previous scientists and engineers and technicians, it all culminated in the production of this amazing telescope. 
And there's no denying that it costs money, that it took time, it took research, it took knowledge, it took will, it took power to make this uh, telescope. But sometimes people, some of the people who are using this telescope, when they observe the universe through it, they can't see that the amazingness or the awesomeness of this universe is also something that needs a designer and a creator. It needs someone to make it. It cannot make itself. And I really want you to ponder on this point. Look at the comparison of the actual telescope that is showing you these images. You're praising it. You're saying it's amazing. You're praising the people involved in the project. You think that they are, you know, uh, th th their names have gone down in history. But what they are observing, that just, yes, it's fascinating, but it doesn't make the, the secular mind acknowledge that this must be uh, created as well. So I just want you to focus on that, inshallah. So moving on, uh, let's take a couple of examples from something that most of us will be teaching. Um, I assume a lot of people here are actually teachers in the classroom or educators of some sort. So when you look at this image, just think to yourself, um, where is the secular embedded ideology in this image? How would you describe this water cycle? How would you teach it? Just think to yourself, what would I say about the water cycle? Can you find the embedded secular concept within this uh, idea that we teach? If anyone wants to type anything in on, in on the chat, you're more than welcome to. Um, so just looking at it, reflecting on it for just a, a second or two, you see that it's a cycle, okay? So it starts off with the water, and when the water is um, gets uh, heated up to a certain temperature by the sun, um, it will form, you know, little droplets which will evaporate. Then they will go up into the sky. They will condense. Then they will precipitate. You'll get rain, and then it will collect in different places, and then the cycle begins again. So when you teach this, when you teach this point, what are you saying? Okay, so we do have some people in the chat, alhamdulillah, um, just so the universe moves in cycles. Okay, so universe moves in cycles, but how does it move? Yes, it's self-generating, exactly. That's the main key here. So um, the scientific term that subtly detaches the will of the creator is what Dina is saying, that it's self-generating. It happens by itself. It's natural. How many times have we used that word? It's natural. And for us, we, we, it's, we don't think there's anything wrong with use, using that word. And at the same time, we will say, uh, if we want to bring in the character and the morals in, into it and the Islamic perspective, we will say, yes, uh, God created this water cycle. So we will say that. But at the same time, we will be saying that it happens by itself because it's cyclic. It's just, you know, there's cause and there's effect and it, it, there's a process which is uninterrupted. So very subtly, are we not embedding secularism within that? Because for the person who does not believe in a creator, for them, they will be, okay, well, you don't need any outside interference. You don't need anything uh, from anywhere else. Okay, does that allow for your comments? I am reading them as I'm going along as well. Okay, so the second case study, uh, is about energy. And I want you to read this statement as well. Energy is not created or destroyed. It transforms from one state to another. How many of us have learned this off by heart when we were in school and not questioned? Energy is not created. Neither is it destroyed. It just goes from one form to another. So again, what is the embedded concept? What is the problem with this statement? Can we rephrase this? without the secular terminology. But the first point, definitely, it's not created. Well, then where did it come from? If energy is not created, where did it come from? And yes, then, you know, it's going from one form to another. It's going from light to chemical or electrical to thermal, chemical to mechanical, chemical, you know, it, it can go from anywhere, heat and light, etc. cetera. So, um, yes, yeah, so someone is saying it's created by Allah and can be destroyed by Allah. So we can see that if we have that correct perspective. But what does the secular perspective of science give you? It basically conditions you to start to think that there is no need for any external force.
because things are just happening by themselves. And these are assumptions that have been made by science. So just to move on, inshallah, you, anybody can type in a question uh, as we're going along. I don't mind, inshallah. It'll help me as well, focus. Um, so the scientific method, for any of you who are science teachers, uh, you definitely know this. And for everyone else, we should know some of it because we have all learned science. So the scientific method, well, there's nothing wrong with the scientific method if you're going to use it properly. You know, if you're going to um, be able to actually test what it is that you want to find out, and you're going to be able to uh, look at the results objectively and give a conclusion. But you cannot always test everything in science, can you? Can you test the universe? Can you say, can you test that there was a big bang? Is that possible? I was just reading an article this morning in just one, uh, it's on one website, and it's just a small article, but I, I can see that how this discussion is going to grow. And the discussion was, scientists fear that there was no Big Bang from the James Webb Telescope. From the data that it sent back, they fear there's no, no uh, Big Bang. So who knows what they're going to come up with, but how many times have we seen that? How many times have we seen that? First, they, they say one thing and then they'll say something else. And the reason for that is because you can't always test everything. And that's one reason. The second reason is that when you construct a hypothesis, you are not always going to uh, be basing your hypothesis on a fact. You can be basing it on certain assumptions. You can assume certain things and then from that bring about certain patterns and principles and then say, okay, this is what we think and now we're going to test it. And it may be that your results might actually give you what you think, but because your basis is flawed, then how do you know the results are actually true? So this is another thing for uh, us to ponder on, contemplate on and go deeper into and look at this uh, trio of uh, secular science, which is nature, cause and chance. So like in the examples I've just given you, we have seen that we ascribe everything to nature. We say that photosynthesis, it's a process of nature where the sun you know, comes down and you know, the, the, the sun hits the chlorophyll and then uh, there's a particular chemical reaction that takes place and lo and behold, uh, the plant has made itself food, okay? It's natural, we say it's natural. We say the life cycle of the butterfly is natural. We talk about cause and effect and we talk about things happening according to chance. And this is what is actually embedded in every single science textbook that we study. Because the science that we study comes from an ideology. It comes from a particular worldview. It comes from a particular perspective. And so this is why it's going to have these ideas within it, the ideas that they are actually trying to promote, which is that there is no need for a God. There is no need for a creator of the universe because the universe creates itself. Processes happen naturally. So uh, this was the background for you about why it is that we need to come up with a uh, something to replace this okay so we need to study science in another way and not just science but our whole thinking process can be done through the 5d thinking model you can apply it anywhere inshallah so these are the five dimensions the 5d means five dimensions right five dimensions of uh thinking so you have analytical thinking analogical thinking critical thinking meditative thinking and moral thinking so, and they go in this order any topic we study, we study it from this order. So I'm going to give you some more detail about this now. What does this mean? What is analytical thinking? So analytical thinking is what scientists are usually doing. If they're studying the universe through different instruments, through different scientific techniques, and, uh, what, uh, and then coming up with a viewpoint. But what we do in the 5D model is that we filter the embedded secular ideology. We remove the ideology from the universe that we are exploring. Whatever topic we are looking at, whether we're looking at the water cycle or we are looking at uh, human skin, the eyes, the nose, senses, whatever we are looking at, we're going to filter away from it the embedded secular ideology. So we're going to explore it. We're going to use scientific processes and the scientific method to understand, but we're not going to allow our... Um, our thoughts to be clouded by the secular ideology that is already there. Then we go to the second step. We use an analogy to compare and contrast human-made objects 
with natural objects for a better understanding. Just to uh, show you the analogy of um, uh, the, the perspective I just showed you of where you have the telescope, where you're saying that this telescope um, you know, was made by many, many different people, but the universe created itself. Okay, so we want this thought process to be uh, initiated and for uh, children to compare, compare different things with each other. And I'm going to give you a very uh, interesting example about this in a minute. Then the third dimension is engaging in critical thinking through questioning to find out the ultimate reality behind natural objects and events. So we want to introduce a few questions and we want the students to really be uh, thinking about what they think, um, you know, uh, comparing the analogy that they find with the uh, thing that they are, uh, are studying and then coming to a conclusion about, well, what is the actual reality? of this thing that I am studying. And that will help more further to take away that secular perspective and lead the student very naturally to the next stage, the next dimension, which is to reflect on the interconnectivity and the complexity and the benefit of natural objects and events to know their own maker. So they will know their maker through this. So anyone who goes through this process is going to basically be able to, in the fourth dimension, to conclude that the whole universe is interconnected and for it to, for one thing to exist, other things must exist. And who is the one who initiated all that existence? And finally, we go to the fifth dimension, the moral thinking, where we read the universe as a meaningful book. We derive moral lessons from it. So we are, talking about science. We're not saying we're going to throw science out of the window, but we're going to throw secular embedded ideology out of the window because it is something that is dangerous for us. It's something that denies the truth. And through this five-step model, we're going to be able to uh, give the children, give students, give ourselves the tools to be able to uh, develop better character and to have uh, the moral compass that the creator has given us and to have uh, follow the path which is the straight path okay so now i'm going to just tell you how we break this down in the classroom so for example at the elementary and primary level we can use instead of saying analytical thinking analogical thinking meditative these are big words we break it down we say explore compare question connect and appreciate and I think the best way, inshallah, is for me to actually show you an example. So I'm going to show you an example of the ship of the desert. So when I say ship of the desert, what comes to your mind? Um, I know that a lot of you are from the Arab world. So uh, good, Nata, camel, excellent. Okay, so, you know, this is how you would normally do a warm up for a lesson. So let's talk about the camel. Let's explore first step. What is this step? Uh, analytical thinking. So what are we going to explore about the camel? Here, what you want to do is give the students a whole set of amazing uh, facts about the camel. So let's look at what this diagram is telling us. So the camel has long legs um, and that keeps its body away from the hot sand. It has a leathery mouth so that it can eat spiky plants. It also has uh, stretchy nostrils. So the sand can keep out of the nostrils and its lips are split. So I don't know if you've ever seen a camel eating. Um, it's quite funny the movement that it makes with its mouth because the lip is split. It can move in two different directions to find tiny, tiny little plants within the sand. Okay. So then um, another thing, uh, if somebody's annotating, could you please delete that if you don't mind? Um, the another thing is the long eyelashes that a camel has, where it had it can you know keep the sand out of its eyes. It also has three sets of eyelids. So the first eyelid that it has is actually transparent. So when there's a sandstorm and it's going in the desert, it can actually see, uh, even though there is a sandstorm. Okay, um, I'm sure you know all these fascinating facts. I'm sure you know many more than I do. Okay, inshallah. So, but to, for the sake of uh, completeness, we'll go through some of them so that you can know how to discuss this with the children. So the hair on the back of the camel uh, protects it from the sun. And we know that it has a hump in which it uh, stores fat, okay? Not water, fat, which it then metabolizes, okay? So there's um, 
uh, a few more fascinating facts. Uh, a camel can drink up to 40 gallons of water in 10 minutes. It can, some people say it can go even six months without food and water. Uh, it can carry very, very heavy loads from, you know, even up to 270 kilograms of load a day. It can uh, travel up to 25 miles a day. It can run 40 miles uh, in an hour, which is very, very fast. Um, and now let's go to its feet. So the feet of the camel are padded. And the, the, the way they are padded is that it stops the camel from sinking into the sand. And it also helps to protect its feet from the heat of the ground. Now, this is really important because this is the actual uh, main thing that we're going to uh, get the analogy from. So when you are doing the first step and you're exploring, you have to uh, give the children fascinating facts. And then you have to focus in on one thing where you're going to be actually finding the analogy. So these feet do not sink into the desert. OK, into the into the sand of the desert um, and that it, they are designed that they, the camel can walk very, very uh, easily across the long, you know, long, hot and stretchy deserts. So this is something which is amazing. And really, you could go on here forever. You could show videos. Uh, you could show some camels racing. You could show them drinking water. You can uh, really uh, explore your lesson in any way uh, that you like. Yes, Sarah, you can uh, definitely ask them different questions to help them to come to these conclusions themselves, inshallah. So now let's go to the second step where we are going to now compare. So our second step is an analogy. Now, if I was to ask you that if we look at a camel as a means of transport and its feet allow it to move across the desert with some sort of ease, what analogy comes to your mind? What form of transport uh, can you find in a desert that is made by human beings? Would anyone like to guess? Anyone want to type in? What do you think? What's coming to your mind? Anyone think of this? A Range Rover, a four wheel drive? So this is going to be our analogy. So Jazakallah khair, Brother Umar. Um, so, so you see how now we, we find the analogy and we start to compare. So we look at the detail now of this uh, four-wheel drive uh, Range Rover. How is the four-wheel drive different from a two-wheel drive? Okay, so now here, some of you might be thinking, well, I'm teaching uh, grade one, how do I do this? Someone might be thinking, well, I'm teaching grade 10, how do I do this? So there has to be differentiation. You have to work it out how you're going to actually teach it in the lesson plan. And we are doing some pilot studies right now, inshallah, uh, to work, work on the details of how it's going to be done in the classroom. But here, what we're trying to do is let you see what the theory is. So we can compare the two. It's a very easy comparison, just in the same way that a camel can go in a desert, a Range Rover can easily move across long stretches of desert without sinking in. And if you show the children a video, they will really love it. You know, it's a, uh, and I'm sure some of them have been in a Range Rover, so you can ask them about that as well. Okay, so now let's go on to the third step, where we now are going to engage in crit critical thinking. We're going to question. We're going to ask the children. You know, many scientists, engineers, uh, over a whole century were involved in manufacturing these four-wheel drives. You can give them a whole timeline of who did what at what time. You know, starting from the 1800s, 1900s, and then onto the uh, modern day vehicles that you have. Um, and did you know that you need 30,000 parts to make uh, one car, one vehicle? So if these are all needed to make um, a vehicle, then what about the camel? Did it create itself? Did it know that it needed to have padded feet? So it made itself some padded feet. Did it know that it um, needed to have uh, three sets of eyelids? Uh, Sarah is saying we can compare the thick wheel of a Range Rover to the padded feet of the camel. Excellent. Uh, and Dina is talking about biomimicry. Um, definitely, Dina, that is definitely right. So we can see how scientists are looking at uh, biological phenomena um, and then creating something based on that. So there is actually one of the uh, topics we have is about an elephant. So we have an elephant's trunk as our main uh, focus. And there's a German company that has made a robotic trunk exactly like an elephant's trunk. It's based on the model of an elephant's trunk. And it's really amazing. Uh, you know, you see the, the video of the, the trunk moving with complete precision. It's fascinating. And jellyfish as well. So biomimicry is definitely something that is a good thing to explore. But here, what you can see is that you've raised the question with the children that did it create itself? 
You know, if, if a Range Rover needed so many people to make it, 30,000 parts had to be put together. What about a camel? How did it know that it had to create itself? It couldn't have created itself. And then we go on to the next step. We connect. And this is a very, very beautiful uh, surah in which a particular verse, uh, which points us towards the camel. That do they not look at the camels, how they are created? And the word yandruna is a very specific word. Very specific. It's about reflection. It's not just looking. Don't just see with your eyes, but actually um, reflect. Reflect on the camel and the people of the desert for them, the camel was something uh, amazing, a sign of honor, a sign of wealth, um, a sign of status. So for them, when they were asked to look at it, if they looked at it with uh, you know, a clear reflection, they would understand, yes, it's created by a creator. It didn't come about by itself. And then in this meditative thinking step, we go a little bit further. So this is where we are now really getting the children to explore how the camel, is it isolated on its own? No, it's not isolated. It is used as transport by people. It, get, uh, it um, eats plants in the desert. Where do the plants come from? You know, the plants need sunlight. The camel needs the plants, the plants need sunlight. Um, and the sunlight, the sun, it, you know, is, uh, holds together the solar system. So we start to make deeper connections in the universe. The camel gives milk and the milk has many vitamins. It is, you know, is really good for you. And the camel as a means of transport, you know, has a deep and detailed connection with human beings. So what we can do now in this meditative step is we start to connect. We see the interconnectivity of the universe at every level, that things need each other and things, um, you know, cannot exist without other things. So the one who made the camel is the one who made the plants, is the one who made um, the milk come out of the camel even, okay, is the one who made the sun is the one who made the solar system. So we see these connections deepening. And then we go on to the divine names. Through this, the one who created must be all-knowing, must be an all-knowing creator. That, that creator cannot be not a, a creator that does not know. How does that creator know that he needs to do all these things? So that particular attribute must be there. He is all-wise that he gave the people who live in such a harsh environment uh, an amazing mode of transport. He is al-Shafi, that he gave the milk, which has uh, healing properties for many, many diseases. And it you know, gives uh, the body energy. And he is a sabur. He made the camel patient. When you look at a camel, you see its patience. Does that not reflect the, 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 the... So this is, in this step, really, we start to deepen our connection with the universe and the creator of the universe. And the last step, Moral thinking is where we start to appreciate. And here, um, you know, we remember, we remember the creator, dhikr, we do dhikr, that when we see the camel the, as a mode of transport, we see the milk, it makes us think of the one who created it. We have fikr, we reflect. What does this mean for us? What does it mean for me? How am I going to derive some moral lessons from this? And we engage in shukr, we are grateful. Okay, if somebody gave you a Range Rover, you'd be so grateful to them. It's a gift that you would never refuse. But no one asked us if we wanted a camel. The creator just made the camel. He gave us this gift that exists. And for it, the ones who use it and need it are definitely grateful. But we should also be grateful that he created this amazing creature. And what moral lessons can we de de derive from looking at a camel? We can derive patience. We know that a camel is very patient, carrying all that heavy load. It works really, really hard and it has humility. It's a very humble creature, okay? So these are the five steps um, of the 5D model. In terms of student engagement, like I said, let's show videos, audios, tell some stories, do activities, have uh, artwork, competitions, whatever um, things you can come up with. Uh, all the better to make it interesting. And as we saw from the Quranic verses teaching us to reflect, we know that the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, as the best model for us, he also taught us how to get the best out of the students by using curiosity, questions, and analogies. There's actually a very, very beautiful book about the teaching methods of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You can uh, see if you can find it on the internet. 
uh, and you'll find uh, many, many different techniques in there. But I just wanted to focus on these three that I found in one particular uh, hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, reported by Abu Huraira, where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, look at this now, curiosity, questioning and analogy. If there was a river at your door and you took a bath in it five times a day, would you notice any dirt? And the Sahaba said, no, there would not be a, any dirt left on that man. The Prophet ﷺ said, this is the parable of the five prayers by which Allah removes sins. So, subhanAllah, how beautiful is this, that the teaching methodologies of the Prophet ﷺ can be found to be helpful for us in our 5D thinking model. Inshallah. So, let's move on. Just to conclude with this point before I go into what we've actually done with this model. The 5D approach has all of these different characteristics. So it's definitely inquiry-based pedagogical uh, in terms of its strategy, okay? Um, it's in line with prophetic methodology. It is able to achieve the objectives of tarbiyah or character education because of the moral lessons that the children can derive. It's based on metacognition because it's a, a self-reflective exercise. It's a self-learning exercise. And in terms of communication and collaboration, it's able to build 21st century skills. So I've obviously not conducted it with you as I would in a classroom. You know, it's up to you to bring in all these things, but you can see, I'm sure you can all see how you would very easily be able to achieve all of these different objectives. And in terms of how we have applied uh, this, okay, before I talk about that, I'm quickly gonna talk about the people involved in this project. So you have um, Dr. Al Rasalan, who is the president of this institute, he has a PhD from Chicago. Uh, his main interest is in the history of scientific traditions of diverse civilization and primarily Islamic and Western. And uh, he's basically, uh, in short, he's into philosophy and he's a, you know, a, a great teacher, alhamdulillah. Um, he's also written for, uh, written different books and he has won the uh, an award in 2014. Uh, from the National Science Book, uh, the National Science Book Award in Malaysia. He's also president of the Asian Philosophical Association and a member of the Turkish Academy of Sciences. And he's the president of this institute and the guiding uh, light for our work, alhamdulillah. Then you have Professor Najati, who is the project director for 5D. He's actually, uh, he has two PhDs, one in economics and one in education. He currently teaches at Al Faisal University in Saudi Arabia, um, and he has worked as a researcher in many different universities. He's also developed a very nice uh, theory called the th Triple H theory, which uh, if you attend any of his courses, you'll get to know, and it's uh, quite an interesting uh, approach. He's also the author of Sayyid Nursi and Science in Islam, Character Building Through Nursi's Mana Harfi uh, Approach, Alhamdulillah. Uh, and then uh, we also have in our team, uh, myself, who is running the education and training programs. Then we have uh, Saba Ansari. She is the director of publications. We're uh, launching a few books now, inshallah. And she also is running the certificate programs, which I will tell you about in a minute. Uh, then we have uh, Nadine Kamal, who is the editor of our newsletter, which comes out once a month. And Aisha Alawais, who is our resource developer. And we have many, many other volunteers working in different capacities to help us get uh, this model off the ground. And just want to tell you that uh, we did a program for children. We did two programs for them, one last January, one in Ramadan, in which we talked about uh, animals in the Quran. And we went through this five uh, step methodology to read the universe. And it was really um, an eye opening uh, session for the children. And this is some of their comments. Uh, you know, they thought it was perfectly designed. Uh, they loved us as the teachers. Um, they wanted to have more classes. They were really looking forward to it. They found it fun, in, informative, interactive. Um, they liked that we went step by step and engaged them in a lot of discussion. Um, and they found it very interesting. Uh, and the conclusion they reached that Allah created us and the universe, they were, you know, alhamdulillah, very, very happy uh, having take, undertaken the course. We've also conducted a few teacher training programs. So just uh, in May, we conducted one uh, with uh, in Oskodar University, where we had some teachers from the UK and their heads. Uh, and just, we had some very nice uh, feedback from them. Um, the head teacher of Buttercup was very uh, thankful to the Turkish community for welcoming us. And uh, they were all agreed that through collaboration, uh, they can see uh, uh, this uh, being applied in their schools. 
And one of the head teachers from Shaksia School, she was so happy with uh, with this that she has gone uh, and now she's researching how to uh, embed 5D thinking into a nursery school that she is uh, going to be setting up. So inshallah, that will be starting in January. So already you can see that the people who are coming across this approach are very much inspired by it. This August, we ran two weeks of uh, intensive teacher training, and um, you can take a screenshot and read this later if you like, uh, but we had some really good feedback. I mean, Sister Aziza, she was saying that I, she, she kept saying paradigm shift. Everything is shifting for me. I'm looking at this from a completely different perspective. Uh, Brother Asad, he was um, very, very happy uh, to be part of this journey, uh, to see the Tawhidi nature of this um, particular program. Um, and he was he said he was blown away. Brother Musa, he said that um, it was a life-changing experience for him. So um, there was, alhamdulillah, a lot of good feedback. So what are we doing now? So if any of you are interested, we are going to be running an online certificate program which is a 14 week program. So this is for the ones who are, you know, really, really going to, uh, really in inspired by this and really want to know a lot more. Um, inshallah, I will share the flyer in the group later on. So there is, there are four courses here, Comparative Perspectives in the History of Philosophy by Dr. Al Pasalan, and that is an excellent course. I have done it myself. It's amazing. Uh, reading Sayyid Nursi um, uh, by Dr. Colin Turner, again, an amazing uh, lecturer. Uh, integration of knowledge through the 5D thinking approach. So basically what I have just done with you now uh, in a very, very deep way and exploration of the existence and meaning of life through civilizational transformation by Dr. Abdullah Hassan. Again, an amazing course. So this is something if you are interested in, you know, getting a certificate, uh, a degree level certificate, which can go towards some maybe, um, uh, you know, studies that you are undertaking, then this is something that would be interesting for you. If you are not interested in something so long term, we are offering a four day weekend program. Uh, so we have uh, two sessions per day, uh, uh, comprising of four hours. So four sessions uh, over four days of four hours each, inshallah, going into the depth of what I have just uh, done with you today. And if you want resources uh, or to know more about any of our courses, you can go onto our websites or you can email us, inshallah. So uh, I think we'll go to question and answer now, Sister Dina. I hope that was um, uh, okay, inshallah. That was amazing. So no matter how many times I listen to this, uh, it never ceases to me to be amazing and mind-blowing. So thank you very much uh, for giving us like a brief introduction about the 5D methodology. And I really get excited when I imagine the transformation that could happen when our young learners would come to think in such a deep, interconnected manner. Um, and before going to the questions, let me try to play devil's advocate, which is not something I'd really want to do, but um, let me go to the big question. So obviously our teachers are limited, you know, by the curriculum, the framework, um, the marking schemes, and the restrictions of the uh, national and international boards of education. So um, getting back to the practicalities of everyday, uh, everyday classroom uh, life, how would this methodology fit into the larger scheme of the curriculum and the, and the framework and so on and the assessment. So in a way, how the teachers would help the students get the grades and yet teach them in such a methodology. Okay, Zakala Hair is a very valid question. And it's, it's, it's one that was asked continuously while we were doing the teacher training courses. So uh, we actually uh, have planned some pilot studies in schools to see how we're going to do this. Um, in one school, uh, what we're going to be doing is taking their science curriculum um, for uh, uh, for about, I think, 12 weeks. 12 weeks, we're going to take the science curriculum, and we're going to embed this methodology into it for them. We're going to provide the resources for the teachers as well, and then ask them to apply it. And then we're going to have a control group as well to see how that's going to work out. So the, if you see the topics like water cycle, for example, senses, these are topics we have to teach anyway. So what we want to do is equip teachers to be able to identify how to bring this methodology within the same topics that you're teaching. Okay, regarding um, the uh, things like assessments, well, we're not saying do away with the science. 
we're saying just teach the science in a way that is without the secular ideology. So it just involves a little bit of organization and a bit of training um, to manage this uh, perspective. Like any teaching methodology, when you take it into the classroom, there's a little bit of adjustment that has to take place, but it's very much doable. Um, and right now uh, we're focused heavily on science because it seems to be the most um, easy thing to, to do, but we are planning to take this into social sciences and into languages as well, inshallah. So we will keep you updated on that. Perfect. So uh, let me just accentuate that, uh, that this is just a teaching methodology and approach, a language that we're, we're, lear we're learning together with the students. It doesn't have to contradict um, what's happening in the assessments or, you know, the uh, the framework. Uh, so another question uh, concerning the lesson plans and the resources. If the teachers are interested in starting and applying this uh, program, I understand that there are a number of interesting resources and lesson pa plans that could guide the teachers along the way. That's right. right. Yes, yeah. right. We have got our sample lesson. We've got one sample lesson plan for each level. We have got uh, some topics for each level. So for elementary level, I've got about, I think, 12 topics um, and then for primary as well. So both they can both be used in elementary and primary. And for secondary, there's about 20 topics on our website, um, which uh, do have some uh, assessments with it. But we have uh, started to work on producing more resources to supplement that material. Um, and we really are, you know, eventually we are looking at curriculum development with this as well, to actually be able to hand you a curriculum and say, here you go, um, your children can do the 5D thinking or anything related to what is in your national curriculum. OK, so we are able to provide uh, resources, provide consultancy, uh, help schools to basically take this on uh, as they want. And also, uh, you could also, if you uh, take the methodology and you understand the methodology in a deep way, you yourself can become very creative in how you bring in different aspects of it, because if you're if you don't have any resources, but you're teaching a particular topic in biology, for example, you're teaching about senses, okay, then you know, okay, I've got to teach um, the sense of smell, I've got to teach the structure of the nose, etc. So in the explore section, you just make it so curious and fascinating for them that they really, really want to learn it. And then you get ask them, okay, what's an analogy for this? And then straight away, you take them into the critical thinking. And within 15 minutes, you can cover this approach. And once you do it regularly, um, the children will catch on and they'll start to look for those things as well, inshallah. So maybe some of the teachers attending today, maybe curriculum developers in the future working on, on that methodology as well. We are very uh, happy to look for people who want to join our team and uh, help us. We're in the very initial stages of this. So you, you know that when you're in the initial stages of something, getting your foot in the door is, you know, is, is a good thing uh, to take it forward and, um, you know, be part of the pioneering work in, in this methodology, inshallah. Inshallah. So let's uh, take some questions from our dear attendees. Maybe you could uh, pop in your question on the chat or just unmute uh, the microphone and uh, let us know that you have a question. We have a, a semi-comment, semi-question um, uh, from Ms. Hager. I guess it works with kindergarten as well. And we talked about this before, and we said I think it was compatible with nursery and kindergarten, no matter what the age of the students, correct? Yeah, it's. Uh, I, we did one on the bee, uh, the ant, the um, spider. So these are topics uh, done in kindergarten. Uh, you know, so if you take the spider, uh, it, it, what are you teaching them about a spider? It, you know, the most uh, amazing thing about it is that it makes a web. And there's actually um, uh, a video that I found in which uh, uh, steel wires, they measured the strength of a steel wire with the uh, spider's web thread, silken thread of the web, spider's web. And they found that the uh, spider's web thread was stronger than the steel wire. So it's oh, really amazing. Kind of web blowing. <laughs> yes. I mean, this is actually, I find a learning experience for the teachers who are involved as well. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I've learned so much, you know, when, when I've been producing these resources um, and really the wow factor about science really comes in. And you know how sometimes science is sometimes seen as difficult or not every child thinks that they can be a scientist. But this is how you inspire scientists by giving them the wow factor, the fascinating factor. So inshallah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, and talking about the wall, the wall factor, I, I just want to accentuate something about uh, metacognition when you said that it relates to the uh, uh, to the pedagogical innovation methods and metacognition. Uh, we know from neuroscience, and we know it as a fact, um, that the interconnected nature of teaching improves the cognitive functions of the brain and also kind of creates new neural connections and synapses. So um, this idea, this notion of interconnection within the field of science, I think it would boost the uh, cognitive performance of students to a great level. Um, and this is something we, we know from science already or from research. So uh, well, sounds the interesting. The integrative approach, um, I mean, I've, I've explained it all, but I didn't actually use the words integrative approach as much. Um, but you can see how uh, even cross-curricular link, uh, linkages that can be made, um, collaboration and communication in terms of 21st century skills, there is a lot that can be happening. It can be a very exciting type of classroom, you know, like uh, STEM. Everyone knows about STEM, right? right. So yes. STEM is now something that is part of every school almost. It's a very essential feature. If you want to be seen to be having the latest methods, you're going to be using STEM. And it's helped children to really love science and technology and uh, engineering and all the subjects associated with it. And then it STEM turned into STEAM. I don't know if you noticed exactly. that they put yeah. art into it as well. So this is something that I found fascinating. And so this 5D thinking model, I see it as the next STEM, inshallah. Uh, because of all, like you said, the different factors, the different educational perspectives and methodologies that are, are within it, inshallah. So we have a question from Mrs. Raghda um, regarding the extended program. How can we register and is it going to be a session or two in the week? Okay, I will share the um, flyer in the group uh, later on. The, if everyone is in the WhatsApp group, is that okay? Mm -hmm. uh, because yeah, there sure. is, is a Google form, so you can just fill in the Google form. Um, and then the somebody from the team will contact you about the details. And there's four four different uh, courses, um, and you can select one course if you want. You can do two, three, or you can do all four, uh, depending on the time uh, uh, availability you have. It's three o'clock Turkish time. I don't know what time that is in Egypt. I assume it's around um, two thirty, or I think it's around maybe the same time even two thirty three. We can arrange the timing and then send all the details on WhatsApp uh, about uh, how to register and uh, all the details needed. Yeah. So we have another question about um, the topics. So some of the topics don't have a clear connection to religion, or at least not to all religions. How can we fix that? Or, or is this um, is this something that is related to the uh, to the methodology? Okay. So basically. We do not we do not need religious knowledge to yeah. this methodology. This methodology is about finding your path to a creator. It's to know that there is a creator who has and his attributes of knowledge, will, and power. There's another thing that um, you know you can uh, focus on in any subject that um, the limitations of a human being um, in terms of our knowledge and our will and our power. When you look at the things around us, you see that the one who created them must be the one who has knowledge, will, and power. So you do not actually need um, Islamic knowledge as such to teach this methodology because you're giving them the tools to look at the signs in the universe. Yeah. So if I look at a flower, I can conclude that flower is created by this methodology. And that's the main thing. And in terms of moral lessons, you know, when I did the uh, pilot uh, course with the children, they were coming up with the moral lessons themselves. And we know that the children are inclined towards goodness. They are on the fitra, so they are going to go for the, uh, you know, the the good the good uh, lessons. And also, we teach them every day, don't we? We say to them, "Be patient, do this, do that." So when you when they see things, they can make those connections. And really, uh, critical thinking as well uh, is uh, is a, a big part of this. And we know that a lot of the problems that we face in the education, particularly in the Muslim world, is that we are producing uh, people who memorize or wrote learn or you know, yeah. just copy, imitate. We're not producing critical thinkers because we've forgotten how to think ourselves, okay? Yeah. So this is, um, that's a very good question. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a theological methodology as such. It's a scientific methodology. It's a rational methodology. It's an approach to reading the universe. 
Yeah, and it's not related to scripture per se. I mean, it's, uh, it's something that is compatible with Judaism, Christianity, and Islam in the sense that it just creates a connection between the world, the, the physical world, and the spiritual world. Oh, alam al ghaib and as as we know. Yeah. So we have another question. Is there a curriculum or a book that already exists which combines the 5D thinking model on teaching, methodologies, biomimicry, and STEM for young learners? Uh, we are in the process of publishing our first book, which goes some way into uh, what this uh, question is asking, definitely, uh, some way into it. But um, in terms of biomimicry and STEM, that's going to come when we do the curriculum work and when we take it to the school level, inshallah, for which we are now in a conversation with quite a few schools across different parts of the world uh, to produce these kind of um, uh, resources, inshallah. So uh, it will become available soon, inshallah. Okay, we have an interesting comment from Mrs. Dua about teaching foreign languages and how it requires some kind of linking between the purposes of learning and the language and the language of spiritual goals. And she finds that learning English is highly dominated by secular atmosphere. Um, would you like to comment on that? And how the humanities or the teaching of languages would be influenced by the 5D thinking methodology? Okay, so- um... character education, for example. It's, it's about worldview, isn't it? The um, foreign languages, which are the languages that are dominating the world. What is everyone trying to learn is English or Mandarin because of the opportunities that these two languages bring because China is you know, in the economic market and <clears throat> it's uh, doing business everywhere in the world. And anyone who wants to do business is going to be learning Mandarin. Um, and English, as we know, is, um, is the language of the world order that exists today. So definitely um, languages are very much linked to what's going on globally. And we need to give a, a perspective to our students that what is the language that's the most important language? And that's the language of the universe. So a lot of these teachings are based on Sayyid Nursi's work. Um, and Sayyid Nursi has written Risale Noor, in which he goes through method uh, you know, methodically uh, approaches to reading the universe. He gives us the guidance of uh, things like, um, you know, resurrection, um, different aspects of um, different things uh, within Islamic knowledge, different things we see around us in society. But I think the main language that everyone needs to learn is the language of the universe. And what I mean by that is to know your, you know yourself, and then you will know the universe. You will see the signs of the universe. It will speak to you. It will say something to you, and it will have an effect on you. So true. So another question, are there any resources available now to further understand how can we apply the 5D model in the classroom? Yes, uh, there's a lot of um, articles on our website. So you can take an article in that we have done all the five steps for you. If you are a teacher in senior level, it's going to be very easy for you. Just take it and you can apply it into um, you know any lesson. You can maybe if you have a project week coming up, so take it, uh, take a project. If you can find one of the topics that's coming up in your course, you can take it and slot it into that. Um, if you are an elementary or a primary teacher, uh, I can provide you with some topics that we've already worked on. So yes, we have produced some resources and we are in the process of producing more. What I'm also suggesting is that for the attendees attending today and will be interested in um, taking the course, uh, what we could do as a school is that we could provide a space for creating maybe workshops and a community of practice for teachers to come together and you know co-create lesson plans. Um, I think that could be helpful for others, you know, to think in a in a group uh, kind of mindset. If this is okay, of course, with the students. Yeah, the teachers who came with us in August, we had I think about forty five teachers. Uh, in total two batches we had and they were doing this exactly what you're saying they uh, started to apply the knowledge they were getting to their own particular settings and the course that we are offering for the weekend is four four days and that is going to be eight sessions so everything I've just skimmed over today is going to be discussed in a lot of depth um, and there's also a question in the chat about maths as well so yes. we have not got any work produced regarding maths um, uh, in our resources just yet, but it is something that inshallah will come with time. And it's like you said, uh, Dina, that uh, there might be people here who have those skills to contribute to this effort and to take this methodology and you know explore it further and give their own particular view on it. 
I think we'll be very astonished with the quality of lesson plans that are going to um, be produced from this group, inshallah. So um, let us also kind of remind the candidates about the pricing options, because I know that you've generously uh, provide these trainings for free, except for the certification. That's right, yeah. Um, so let me just go back to this slide where I have the certificate, the uh, courses. So the four day weekend program, it's, uh, it's completely free. Uh, if you, but if you would like to have a certificate uh, to show that you have done this, then we are going to charge a, a small fee of uh, $50 for it. Okay, so even that is hardly anything. Um, and this course um, on the left-hand side, you can see the uh, certificate courses. Now these are invaluable, especially if you are somebody who is doing masters, um, you can maybe even take one of these uh, courses as part of your course. Uh, Uskudar University is very willing to give credits for it. Um, and also they're also going to give a certificate, which I think is for, uh, I'm not sure exactly, but it might be about $150, $200, inshallah. Okay. Sure. So um, if anyone is interested in applying, uh, the school is going to, Alexandria Language Schools are going to also sponsor a few scholarships for people who are interested in taking the certification. Yeah, so um, really, uh, I've just really touched the surface today because obviously I, I'm just giving you an introduction. It's like a flavor of what's to come. But the depth that the instructors go into um, is really, really mind-blowing. You saw some of the um, the feedback from the uh, the participants. And, you know, and I, I myself attended this so many times, given this so many times. I find something new every time. Every time I find something new, which makes me think, okay, I didn't know, I didn't think of it from that way before. It's a very growing and nourishing experience. Um, there's a there's a question in the chat. A biology teacher saying that I uh, mentioned the name of Allah when explaining something. Uh, am I near this methodology? Obviously, in mentioning the name of Allah or bringing in any um, Islamic perspective is a very rewardable action, and it's you know it's something definitely we should encourage. But the reason is this is different is because when you when you islamicize something you put something on top of something that already exists when you do integrative uh, approaches you are embedding the tawhidi perspective within your uh, the, your teaching so the analogy i like to give is a, of a cake so i have a cake it's a, and it's a plain cake and on it, I put some beautiful decorations, some amazing butter icing and some pretty flowers. We've all seen those amazing cakes these days. So I make this cake and it looks beautiful. And it, the, when you taste it, the icing is amazing, but inside you can't taste anything. So this is Islamicizing. But integrating is when you put that same flavor inside the cake as well. That the cake itself, without even that icing, is going to taste beautiful. So we teach the children okay so you know you look at a flower here's a flower and you look at it from the 5d approach the child will come to the conclusion themselves that this is a created uh thing and that in itself will be their inspiration you don't have to tell them you give them the tools to read it themselves Yeah, just commenting on that, uh, I think secularism is so embedded in the curriculum that it has become hidden and um, unperceptible to the extent that we can see students actually uh, growing towards atheism, uh, either Muslim or Christian students in Egypt, in the Muslim world and around the world. I mean, the growing trends of atheism is particularly um, noticeable these days. So I think that changing the roots of the methodology and the way we approach things is extremely important. So do we have any more questions? I mean, I didn't really go into it too much about the effect of secularism on our society, but if you uh, go to some statistics, there's one latest st uh, statistic that came out of the US, which I found very disturbing. And they said that 24% of people who grow up in Muslim households in the US are no longer Muslim when they are adults. That's one in four. And that's very disturbing. Why is this? What is the problem? There is a crisis in the Muslim community because people cannot answer the questions the children are asking. We're not looking from the correct perspective. Secularism is bombarded in our heads, you know, in the media, in the education system. And 
when you have a parent or a teacher who's not equipped to answer the questions that the child has, the child is going to withdraw and think, okay, you don't have my answers. So I will go where there are answers. And mm -hmm. this is the dangerous thing. And this is why it's essential for any teacher really to have the tools at their disposal to be able to deal with these kind of questions and perspectives. I think the same applies to Christian households as well. I mean, it's like it's a, it's, it's becoming a very general phenomena uh, in the West as well. So uh, this is this is scary, as you said. Um, yeah. So Mrs. Rowan is telling us we have to help students to connect to the bigger picture. Yeah, very true. OK, so uh, I think we're running out of questions. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone attending with us today. And I would like to thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Ozma, for gracing us with your presence and for being so kind in accepting our invitation. Um, and what we're going to do next is that we're going to share all the information related to registration and the training co uh, course. And if anyone has any questions, just make sure that you send us a private message to the admins um, on the group. And we'll make sure to respond as quickly as possible, inshallah. Okay, Jazakallah, Sister Dina, for having me and uh, to all the participants and to everyone's questions and uh, feedback on this. Um, inshallah, we look forward to you coming and joining some of our courses uh, so that you can be part of this 5D journey with us. Jazakallah. And we look forward to having you in Egypt next time. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and see you in our upcoming sessions and workshops, inshallah. Have a great evening. Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.